Greetings and welcome to the University of Minnesota Alumni Association's webinar series. My name is John Ruzek and I'm the Senior Director of Alumni Networks here at the University of Minnesota. Thanks to everyone, alumni and friends, who have made time to join us live today. It's exciting to kick off our uh, slate of career uh, webinars here in October. And we got some uh, good ones coming up, which I'll tell you about in a second. But first, what challenges are you facing as a leader? What questions would you love to ask a leadership coach? That's going to be the fun part of our webinar today, as our speaker facilitates an open hour of questions and coaching around implementing strategy, leading change, developing and retaining talent, and professional growth. And the layout's going to be a little bit different today. Our speaker will do a, a presentation, but along the way, uh, be engaging our audience uh, on some specific questions and also open, opening it up for some, uh, some Q&A as well. Uh, today's webinar is part of a free series uh, offered by the University of Minnesota Alumni Association where we're having conversations with experts about career, life, and learning topics. Uh, we're running monthly webinars from now until May, and the webinar is being recorded and will be viewable afterwards uh, via a minnesotaalumni.org slash alumni webinar series. Uh, just give us a few days and we'll get it posted up on our YouTube channel. And if you're on Twitter right now, tweet at, tweet at us with the hashtag UMNWebinar. I uh, would love to hear from you on Twitter uh, as well if you're on the Twitter. And upcoming later this week on Thursday, October 15th, we have Say No to Networking and Yes to Growing Your Network, uh, a user's guide to intentional connecting. And also on the 29th, I'll be presenting on making the most of LinkedIn and doing a open Q&A regarding everything LinkedIn. So uh, feel free to sign up to, uh, for those at our alumni webinar series webpage. A couple housekeeping items uh, that I'd like to get uh, go over before we start. If you have joined the pre presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default, so if you'd prefer to listen over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane of your GoToWebinar panel and dial-in information will be displayed. Also, sometimes there is audio issues if you're listening over a wireless signal. We always recommend that if people can find a hard line, hard wire uh, to listen on uh, that uh, sometimes helps with audio difficulties as well as closing uh, unneeded programs that may be running on your computer. There's going to be a couple times uh, during the webinar today we're going to be asking people for questions so uh, use the GoToWebinar uh, question panel on your control panel and we'll monitor them along the way and we'd love to hear from you. So let's get down to it. I am excited to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Rita Webster. She is a leadership advisor, trainer, and coach. She earned her PhD at the University of Minnesota, and her dissertation research focused on how high-performing leaders use peer relationships to build confidence and successfully implement new ideas in their organization organizations. Rita has worked with an impressive list of clients, including Thomson Reuters, Best Buy, Land O'Lakes, General Mills, and many more. She is an active participant in the Minnesota High Tech Association, the Minnesota Change, Minnesota Change Management, a former board member of the Minnesota Organization Development Network, and a volunteer mentor for Mentium and a member of the City of Lakes Rotary. Rita is very passionate about women's leadership. She is a founding mother of Awesome Women, a nonprofit dedicated to having every woman's voice make a difference, and is launching the Wise Leader Women's Forum designed for women leading at the director and VP levels. Rita, thanks so much for being with us today. Hello, Rita? Hello, Rita? Check, check, one, two. Just one second. We're just having some audio difficulties here. Hello, Rita. Check, check, one, two. Hello, Rita. Can you hear me? 
Okay, everybody just hang in there one second. I'm just going to check uh, audio here. Can you hear me now, Rita? Hello? Hello? Is this working? Yes. Okay. I'm good? Okay. Thank you, John, for that nice warm introduction. I think we have the technical difficulty figured out. So welcome, everyone, to our webinar um, today. I'm excited to be here, and this is a great opportunity for you to get a chance to ask some questions. I've been a leadership coach for almost 20 years, which is amazing to me, and uh, have have worked with many different leaders across the Twin City area and also with teams that are wanting to work together better. So let's jump in. All right, I'm going to change, I'm going to give you presenta uh, presenter control here to get over to your deck, and we'll go from there. Okay, so let's jump in. And just uh, put it up in the slide mode there. My slide mode. Uh, just down at the bottom. Here. There you go. Mhm. Mm mm -hmm. okay. There you go. Here. Okay. We are ready to go. So here's our agenda for today. I wanted to hear a little bit about what questions you might be bringing. So we'll I'll collect some of those here right at the beginning. If you've had a chance to think of some questions, you can start typing those in. Then we're going to talk a little bit about five deeper challenges that are facing most of us and that many of us maybe don't even really recognize because they're just so embedded around us, but they do have a pretty big impact. We'll talk a little bit about the implications for you and your organization that those challenges might be offering to you. And then I'm really curious about positivity and we're going to do a little bit of a uh, level of positivity poll, and then a tool that you can use as a leadership coach. I'm always giving my clients tools, and they're always asking for tools that, that they can use. So I'll make sure to give you one of those today. Then we're going to talk about blending the seven Fs, which is a way to, I'm going to say, be able to bring more things together during our short bursts of time, uh, the way we live today. And then the last slide will be a way that you can stay in touch. So let's go ahead and I want to check with you to see what questions you might like us to tackle. All right, and now is a good opportunity uh, to use that question panel uh, in your uh, GoToWebinar control panel. And if there's anything right now that's uh, uh, on your mind, just type it in and we'll uh, try to take those accordingly. So, all right, we have one uh, that came in, Rita, that is there any legitimate psychological concern regarding the effect of charisma on a leader? In other words, how important really is charisma for a leader to have? And what's the, what's the extent to which this charisma contributes to followers' perception of said leader? That's a great, that's a great question. And when I think in terms of charisma, where I like to point people is to say, Think about authenticity. So those leaders that can be most authentic, that's what followers are really looking for. So do they believe what it is that you're saying? Do they think that you're on track? Do they know that what you're speaking is the truth for you? And especially when I work with women leaders, that's one of the things that we talk and work on quite a bit is who are you authentically as a leader? Not trying to be someone else, not trying to model yourself in a certain way, but really being true to yourself. Any other questions before we get started? And you'll be able to enter questions as we go. Yep. So let's go to... Um, the, the five challenges that I talked about. So this is challenge number one, which is that we're living longer. And that is having an impact. So if you 
and even before I start with the challenges, if you find yourself kind of confused or stressed out, these five challenges might give you some clues as to why. So we're living longer. What impact does that have on us? And so as you might know, um, some of the questions that happen in families is, who's going to take care of mom and dad? as they age or who is taking care of grandma and grandpa as they are aging and that can have a big impact on families. I know my own mom, I grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin and my mom wants to stay in her house, she's 86, until the, her last breath and thank goodness I have a couple of brothers that have farms adjacent to her farms. So they are able to stop in in the morning, stop in in the evening, check on her, make sure that everything's okay. And I have a situation where my neighbor, actually, her dad lives in California. And so it, she tries to fly out to see him long distance wise. She's trying to figure out how does he get the right kind of care? How can she find someone that can come in and be a companion for him? At what point do you make that hard decision that they can't live on their own anymore? Might need an assisted living situation. The other part about living longer is work and retirement. So we have many more options and as the traditional retirement age comes around, there's a lot of folks who are stepping back and saying, hey, I don't want to be working the 40 hour, 60 hour weeks, but I still want to be involved and I still have a lot to contribute. So we see organizations like Patina that are springing up and what Patina does is it has a whole network of leaders that have 25 plus years of experience and they can tap those leaders, <clears throat> they can go to different companies to find out what projects might they just need some help with or where's a key expert that they might want to tap into their expertise without having to hire a full-time person and that's working out very, very well and also then those older workers or seasoned workers <laughs> can be mentors and so Patina is looking at how can they set up a mentoring program to be able to tap that level of expertise. So I'm curious out of challenge one, the fact that we're living longer, what, uh, how might that be impacting you? All right, now's the time to... Uh... Is there anything in particular? Enter those as far as uh, um, living uh, living longer, as far as both the 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 impact it has with our our family life, but then also uh, you know uh, that that second age, the second act uh, of the career uh, career span. You know, one uh, that came in just in the time being, and it might uh, speak nicely to uh, one of your upcoming slides. One of our participants asked, "Can you speak to inner?" intergenerational leadership and learning strategies. Yes, I will cover that as we're moving forward. I've got a slide I think that will speak to that. So let's hold that question and see if we can cover it as we're moving forward. Let's move on to challenge number two. We're living in a mosaic culture. What does that really mean? Well, it means that we've got five generations in the workforce for the very first time and there's lots of different ways that diversity presents itself. So we might have differences of religion, gender, transgender, same-sex marriages. So there's lots and lots of diversity there. My daughter is a freshman at South High School in Minneapolis and they have nearly a hundred different languages in that school system. And other than English, their top languages are Spanish, Somali, and Hmong. So then it begs the question, well, what does that mean in terms of communicating and reaching all those families? When I get a communication in the mail, on the front side it's in English, and if I flip it over, there's usually two or three languages that are on the, um, on the back side. So what does that mean for that district? What does that mean for our organizations in terms of communicating in all the different languages that we find? And also being able to understand different traditions. So how do our holidays match up with the, and how are we, 
how are we acknowledging the different traditions and different groups of people that are bringing to our workplace. And I just read on the front page of the paper this morning that there's, um, there's uh, an initiative to change today, which is Columbus Day, to more of a, a day that, that uh, represents all the, the various, um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of, all the various different cultures in, in that we have in this population. country. Yes, indigenous populations. There we go. Okay, what does this challenge bring up for you? Is there something that, a question that you have around this, or is there something that you'd like to learn more about this? I know we have a question about speaking to intergenerational leadership, and um, I can speak a little bit to that in terms of, of working with the millennials. Those uh, people, I really admire the millennials, quite frankly, because they are really teaching us what work and life balance looks like. So some of the things that they are looking for from their leaders is they want to be able to have an opportunity to contribute in a way that really makes a difference and is important to them. They also want to have a clear path, so they want to know how they're going to advance in their careers. And the other thing that I think is really fascinating is that um, there's re reverse uh, mentoring going on now. So we've got the younger workers, the millennials, that are actually mentoring the, um, the baby boomers. And I think I find that quite fascinating. I think that's a really neat thing that's coming about. So let's take a look at challenge number three. So we're in a society that expects more for less. What does that really mean for us? So Target has actually made this the hallmark of their business model. And they're doing things like bringing in top designers that can create products that are less expensive, yet high quality that you really can't get anywhere else as a way to differentiate themselves. In my coaching work, <clears throat> my clients are always looking for more <laughs> expecting more for less. So I'm always looking for how do I add more value? So one of the ways that I did that this year is I added a newsletter and a blog so that I can get more information out to them. And I'm also building peer coaching groups. And this helps in a number of ways because it's less expensive and it also provides the benefit of being less isolated as a leader. They get to build uh, relationships with their peers and be able to share best practices. It also creates an opportunity for broader uh, shared perspectives and a place for solving complex business problems. Most of the problems that our organizations are facing are complex. And what we know from the research is that when we can take time to reflect and add other people's perspectives in there, we come up with better solution. And a peer group is also a good place for leaders to get support and to help each other to be able to stay positive. John, do we have some questions coming in? And for challenge three, so if, do you have a question or a comment? What do you notice is coming up for you or how is it impacting you, the fact that we have a society that expects more for less? Um, as far as the questions coming in right now, um, and this might be for a little later, um, we uh, definitely have a lot of interest in, in general, uh, how do I become better leader questions, and also some advice for first-time managers or new leaders who are maybe uh, stepping into those positions or they're managing uh, multiple people. Okay, yes. Let's pick those up, John, as we move through uh, at the end of challenge five. Will you remind me that we have those questions waiting? I will. Mm -hmm. All oh, right. Wait, wait, we did, we did get one more, one more for less here. Uh, right. Okay, so, okay, so um, this person is uh, respectfully asking, isn't more for less counterproductive due to the law of diminishing returns? Um, being able to see two movies with one ticket will make us appreciate movies less. So I don't, uh, I don't know if I understand the example correctly, but uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, take that question about uh, about uh, more for less and the law of diminishing returns. 
That's a great question and a great perspective to ask about this. There is some research that is coming out that says that it, as we work longer hours, we actually get less done. And because we're we're just we're tired and it's too much and we're pressing to get too many things done and we do need to have a break and we need a chance to rest and rejuvenate so I think there is uh, from a work perspective if you're going fast if you're you're staying late just to realize that you're not really in the end getting ahead with that so how can you balance so that you are spending the right amount of time and you're getting clear about what are the things that you want to get done. Okay, let's go on and take a look at challenge four. This one is we demand information transparency. What does information transparency mean? It means we have access to more data and more information. So is that a good thing? When we're looking for something, let's say I'm trying to search out a medical procedure, maybe I need to have a, a knee surgery on my meniscus, I can go online and I can search for doctors, I can search by location, I can search by clinics, and I can search by price. All that is fantastic when we're trying to make a decision. However, on the other side of it, we get overwhelmed by all this information. You're probably experiencing this. Think about LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Google, and the list goes on and on. And then there's email. Think about your inbox right now. And what do you feel in the pit of your stomach? I know for me, just thinking about it, I'm, I'm remembering that I have two emails that I need to return to make appointments. I'm remembering that there's emails left from Friday that I didn't get to. And I'm remembering that there's a long list even below that and how frustrated I get sometimes with how do I manage all of that and make sure that things do not drop through the cracks. And then I put this picture in here of these teens with their smartphones in hand. So I have a 14-year-old and a 17-year-old at home, and they are connected to their devices all the time. They've never known a world without Google and a laptop and a cell phone. And so I wonder sometimes, what does that really mean? Do they ever get a chance to actually be alone? And my son actually was in a football game on Friday night and Saturday morning he had all of his friends over and they were watching the replay of the game, talking about the different plays and what they would have done differently and why the game went the way that it did. So that immediate information is there for us. There's also some new research coming out because we're really wanting to take a look at how this, uh, having all the smartphones and technology so easily accessible to kids, what's happening to their brains? And there's some research that's coming out to show that actually the physical part of their brains are starting to change as a result of processing the information. And there's also some research coming out that's suggesting that kids with ADHD or attachment issues are having some significant behavior issues due to what happens in their brains because of the speed and the intensity of the lighting and the colors. Every time a new upgrade comes out, it seems like it's faster, the colors are brighter. And for, for some kids, that's not a good thing. So I've been letting people know if you're a parent and you have a young child and if you're having some behavior issues, you might want to take a look at what's, how much time they're spending on tablets or smartphones. And then also, many teens are not getting enough sleep because they're texting on their devices well into the wee hours of the morning. The other thing about the, the uh, demand for information transparency is affecting our IT functions in all of our organizations. So from United Health Group to Home Depot, they're all trying to stay ahead of the cybersecurity, and it's a serious problem because most of us, or a serious challenge, most of us are concerned about where our personal information um, could end up. 
And then also the challenge of big data. So wondering and trying to figure out how and where do we store that information? How do you harvest and sort that data so you can actually use that data to make good decisions? And then the big question, who has access to that information? I know I think about that when I'm putting my information and giving my information. Where is this going to actually end up? So some of the challenges that we face with demanding the information transparency. And questions or thoughts about this challenge, that how does it impact you? One, uh, one of our participants just wrote in is that how can a small business compete with greater expectations and increased cost of information? Oh, that's, an, that's an excellent question and a really important one. And back to the technology, I advise small business owners to, to really research the technology and more importantly than that, to step back and say, what is your strategic vision? What are you trying to accomplish? It's business first and technology second. Sometimes small business owners can get thrilled with the technology and it becomes like a shiny object so that it's important that they step back and really say, what am I trying to accomplish with this? What's the business goal? And then select the technology that will actually fit for their business. Just because there's a lot of bells and whistles doesn't mean it necessarily is a good fit or that you really need all those bells and whistles in your business. There's one that came in that that I think was more along the lines of the cha challenge three that you outlined, but I think it could also maybe have some implications for challenge four. Uh, one of our participants wrote in, how do I carve out time to be strategic and creative with so many demands on my time? So really uh, seeking ways that uh, she can be more planful and less reactionary. That is an important question. And the time isn't really going to create itself. So you have to be the one that decides. A lot of times I will advise my coaching clients to take the first 10 minutes of their day block it out on their calendar so that no one else can schedule during that time come into your office, shut the door, and just relax and take a deep breath, and then take a look at your day and set your priorities. If you know what you're trying to accomplish, then you can figure out where's the best use of my time. The other piece that comes into this, especially for women leaders, is saying no. You can't be all things to all people. And so again, if you can get clear about what is it that you're trying to accomplish, what's important to you, then you can start to select where to say no, where to say yes, and the only way that you're going to get that time is if you take it. Some people like to do it at the end of the day. The other thing that I like to recommend is that you get off your devices for a certain period of time every day. And again, you can be in charge of when that time is, but just to make the decision that you're not going to respond to email for, whether it's a half an hour, whether it's an hour, or whether you have 15 minutes. All of it helps and all of it you can use. Any other questions that you see, John? Let me see. I, I, I think we're good right now. Let's go into challenge five, and then we have a poll coming up that the audience, I think, will be very interested in. Okay, this is a big one. Challenge five, we're searching for meaning in our work. Have you ever felt like either one of these folks? Uh, work is stressful for us, and there's increasing demands, fewer resources, shorter go-to-market times, and we can feel like these two folks. Getting into the right role is paramount here. And this is what I work with my clients a lot on. And um, companies aren't going to create a career path for you anymore. So as an individual, you have to figure out what you want, where do you fit. And if you have people that are reporting to you, helping them sort out where, where do they fit 
and what is it that they want. The millennials won't stay around if they don't see a path for promotion, if they don't have flexibility, and if they feel like they're not doing work that makes a difference in the world. It's really important for them to do meaningful work. And actually for all of us, we get energized when we're doing work that feels meaningful to us. I remember coaching a very bright, talented female leader in a mid-size organization. She was about midway through her career. <clears throat> she was in a traditional role, but she didn't find the work challenging or satisfying anymore. So when she came for leadership coaching, what she really wanted to find out is, where do my strengths lie? Where, what am I passionate about? And how could I make a bigger contribution to my organization? Well, what we discovered was that she had a real passion for talent management, and she was really good at it, and it didn't have anything to do with the current role that she had. So she was able to build a business case for a new role, and now she's flourishing. The organization actually would have lost her because she was getting ready to leave because she could not see where she could be able to make the contribution that she really wanted. Now she's making meaningful contributions. Whenever I talk to her, she's bubbling, she's excited, and we usually talk strategy, and she's got amazing ideas for how to, for that organization to be able to really cultivate their talent. And she's making incredible contribution to the company's rapid growth. Another example was a CFO that was about 15 years into his career, fast-growing company, and he wanted more responsibility in his role. And through coaching, he was able to achieve his goal. And he's now in line for a COO role, which was originally his dream. And again, he went from really thinking he might want to move to a nonprofit organization to being able to figure out how could he make a contribution in the organization that he was in. And what he did was he got clear and he started making that bigger contribution actually before he got the promotion. He collected some data, he started to implement some of his new ideas, our coaching work gave him the confidence to be able to do that. He could talk out loud in our sessions about the work that was meaningful and important to him. I have a book cover that is on this slide, A Life of Being, Having, and Doing Enough. This is an amazing author. His name is Wayne Mueller, and he has been working with leaders all over the world for years and has really discovered that, that the primary oh, frustration, I would say, is that we're just exhausted and we're, we're really not able to, to do the kind, we're, we've got too much to do, really, and we're just not humanly possible and capable of getting all that done. And then that creates worry, because we want to be able to make a contribution and we want to be able to get things done. And here's a quote that I think is really mm, valuable from Wayne's work. He says, Worry comes with an implicit promise that abiding in its company will ensure that our problem will be solved and that we can somehow actually worry it away, fix it before anything bad happens. But worry is a false promise. It's a Trojan horse, a wolf in sheep's clothing. More importantly, worry steers us away from trusting in our own essential wholeness, wisdom, and strength to be able to handle in the moment whatever we are given. It denies any capacity to identify or recognize when the time comes the right next thing to do. And as you can see, uh, both of these folks are really frustrated about that. Any questions about this slide or comments? And then we'll move on to the poll. Looks like we're good right now and uh Maybe we'll do the poll and then see what comes in on the other end. And we also have uh, some other the questions that have uh, come in along the way. So should we launch the uh, – all right. So for folks who are on uh, GoToWebinar here, you will see a, a poll launching in your window. Which of these five challenges is impacting you living longer, living in a mosaic culture, uh, society expects more for less, 
We demand information transparency in searching for meaning in our work. So we'll give this a few more seconds for you to fill out the poll, about maybe five more seconds, and then we'll close the poll and then we'll show you the results. All right. All right, so a lot of people, almost two thirds of folks are, are searching for meaning uh, in their work, uh, followed up with about a fourth, um, feeling that the challenge that society uh, expects more for less. So what do you think of that, Rita? This is so congruent with uh, polls that we've done with other groups of folks that searching for meaning in our work always comes out as the top challenge. So I, I find that really fascinating. And, and so I want to say that goes back again to getting clear on what it is that's important to you, understanding what your strengths are, and then figuring out how do you make that contribution because you're the one that has to find the meaning in your work. Sometimes it means leaving your organization and I'm going to say many times you don't have to leave your organization. If you can get clear about what you want to do that's really important for you, you can oftentimes find that meaning in your work. Mm -hmm. Um, at this point, you want to. We had a uh, one question about the intergenerational leadership and learning strategies, and another on the advice to first-time leaders. Uh, would you like to take those at this time? Sure. Advice to first-time leaders: find a mentor, whether it's in your organization, whether it's outside your organization, but find someone that you can learn from, and then attend webinars like this, talk to other people in your organization. There is a lot of information on the web about leadership, and you can get kind of lost in there. So um, let's go to that next slide. I think that might link to that question as well, because here's some things to take a look at in terms of uh, the implications for you and your organization. When I'm working with the leaders, these are the three things that really they're all trying to do. They're trying to implement strategy. They're usually having to lead change because there's something new that's coming in the organization or there's something that's uh, making a change important and prevalent. And then developing and retaining talent. So to implement the strategy, you have to know what the strategy is. I'm often surprised when I'm working with leaders and I ask them, well, what is the strategy that you're working on and that you're trying to implement? Many times they don't really know. They have kind of a general sense about what they're supposed to be doing, but they really aren't clear on it. So the thing about strategy is, as a leader, you need to be really clear about what that strategy is. Because the people that you work with, and if you have teams that are reporting to you, they use that strategy as a lens to make decisions. So to make that strategy clear and concise and simple and easy for them to understand in practical terms is an absolute must. In terms of leading change, I get a little frustrated with this one because change is such a buzzword these days. I wish we could find a better word because just the thought of change, if you think about it, for most of us, it makes us a little uneasy because it means something's going to be different and, you know, we're kind of creatures of habit. We like consistency. So um, since we still need to deal with the word the change, it it often brings up the element of fear. And fear can wreak all kinds of havoc, from passive aggressive behavior to having people who actively work against whatever the initiative is that you are trying to move forward. And we need to remember that people are the ones that make change happen. I know I'm not telling you anything new here, but we kind of forget about it because we can get so involved in trying to get to that end result that we forget to step back. And again, stepping back and reflecting, one of the most important things that as a leader you can do, and it's one of the first things that I know fall, fall off our to-do list. So it, around leading change, you need to know who the people are that are involved. Really understand what's important to them and figure out who are your early adopters. 
They're the ones that are going to lead that change forward. Then you need to find out, well, who are the key influencers? And they are almost never the people in the management positions. They're usually somebody in the organization that people trust, that they know they don't have an ulterior agenda. They usually understand the business or they understand the product, and they're usually held in high regard. I have a colleague who has a business called Key Hub, and he has figured out a process for organizations to be able to assess and find out who are those key influencers, and they're, the organizations are always surprised at who it is because it usually is not who they expect. So if you're leading change, you got to know that. And then figure out who's going to be your resistors. There are always those folks that are, are um, really not wanting to move the change forward, if you can find out a way to get them involved at the beginning, it will make a big difference. The other piece to think about is the culture in your organization. How does your culture operate? How well do you understand how things actually get done? And then most importantly, connecting the change to what's in it for me. You need to understand what's in it for you and your teams and your colleagues as well. And then be thinking about why is the change necessary? Help people understand why and have a communication plan so that you know the steps that you're going to take to make sure that the communication happens. And the third one, developing and retaining talent. And you probably know this as well, but we sometimes forget, people don't leave organizations. They leave their managers and their supervisors. My niece is a millennial and she was working in an organization and they, the company promoted her colleague to be her supervisor, but they did not give that colleague some training and so the colleague really was floundering. She really didn't know she had been a subject matter expert, had done her, her role really well and had gotten promoted and that's that's not an uncommon thing in organizations, unfortunately. So you're, if you're in a, your organization and you're thinking about promoting someone to a supervisory or management manager role, make sure they get training so they understand what to do. And on the same token, if you have managers and supervisors that are not performing, make sure that you check in with them and make sure that you help them get a development plan, find out what it is that they need help with. And then if they really are in over their head or it's something that they really aren't well suited to do, move them out and put them into a role where they can be happy and where they can uh, contribute. Okay, any questions coming in, thoughts, comments about the implications for you and your organizations? Okay, it looks like we're in pretty good shape. So let's move on to the next poll. Right, what is, what's your overall level of posit positivity on a scale of one to five, five being the happiest, one being, um, Maybe the not so uh, happiest. And, and I'm we'll doing this one too because I'm curious. We know that people make better decisions when they're in a place of positivity and staying positive can be a real challenge. So I'm very curious in our group today, what's your overall level of positivity? So number five, couldn't be happier or down to number one, negative often. All right. Well, the results are in, and it looks like uh, kind of half and half, and and uh, and you know and that's understandable from a career development perspective. Is that um, you know there there may be some people who are in good uh, good position uh, positions where they are as far as their career track, but are kind of seeking to improve, and then you know you might be in a a, a period of transition or in maybe not so. Uh, great of a work environment and and looking for those skills on how to uh, uh, further develop your leadership or possibly find that type of leadership role that would give you meaning but uh, 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 what, what would your comments be Rita? I'm really happy to see how many people are at a four so given the kinds of demands that are in our businesses today and in our organizations 
that most of the people on this call are doing something right. So they're probably taking good care of themselves and they are um, they probably have some good sense about not good sense, but have a, a good direction about the contributions that they're wanting to make. So congratulations for this group in terms of your level of positivity. It's good to see. All right. And I'm trying to close out this uh, this uh, poll here, so I apologize if the slide is not showing up. But why don't you just keep keep going, Rita, and I'll... I'll uh, figured out on my end. Well, leadership always comes down to it's personal. It's who you are and what you're trying to accomplish. And my clients are always asking for tools that they can use. So this next slide, as soon as John gets it so that you'll be able to see it, I can talk about it, though, before we see it on the screen. This is a tool that leaders find very valuable. And we are always a work in progress, so we're always learning and also um, expanding our, our knowledge and our experience base. And kind of back to that piece when I was talking about you really need to understand the strategy of your organization. You really need to understand where are you going as a leader? What's important to you? So this tool, here's what you do. So you think about who do you want to be 20 years from now? You write down the age that you'll be, this can be kind of shocking for some people, <laughs> but you, you write down the age that you will be and then start to imagine what would you like to have in your life at that age? Where do you see yourself living? Personally, what are you doing? How are you feeling? Professionally, what are you doing and how are you feeling? I know for me, 20 years from now, I'll actually be 81. That's unbelievable to me. But when I and when I think about it, I want to be physically active. I've always said I want to be able to downhill ski. I don't downhill ski right now, but if I wanted to do it, I want to be able to. Jimmy Carter is one of the people that is becoming my mentor and role model. I just see how much work and joy and contribution he's made in these years, especially in the last from 70 to 90. It's it's really and amazing. He's a great example of someone that is connected to the work that has meaning for him and it's making a difference. I also know that I want to do some international travel. I'd like to be working with leaders around the world, especially women leaders. So think about 20 years from now, what what's important to you? Where do you want to be? And then back it up to seven years from now. How old will you be in seven years? Will your kids be out of school? Will they be still in school? Your parents, how old will your parents be? What do you expect that you may have to help with them or be involved with their care in some way or another? What do you see yourself? What are your aspirations? Where do you see yourself professionally in seven years? And make some notes to yourself. And then look at three years out. Three years from now, so start with how old you'll be how old will your kids be, and what is important to you three years from now that will be a stepping stone to get you to what it is that you really want to see 20 years from now. Your bucket list gets filled in here, so where are the different spots that you want to put some of the things that are on your, your bucket list. And think, do not think about any kind of restrictions. Really think about this in terms of what would be ideal for you. We've worked with clients that when they've done this exercise, all of a sudden they're on fire because they can really see how things connect. So we're not going to do anything with this right now, but this is a tool to take when you take a few minutes to reflect and actually have carve out some time to sit down and do this. You'll find it. There's a lot of value in it. All right, Rita. I've... Uh... The, the presentation's on my side now. For whatever reason, there's a little bit of a glitch, but I can advance your slides. So, um, okay. And and but the the one thing is, uh, uh, look at the quest. If you if there are additional questions, uh, look at them on the screen where you are, um, and um, field the questions off there. And I'll just run the deck from from my side. 
Okay, sounds good. If there are any questions, we're getting down near the end of our time together, so if there's any questions that you haven't asked yet or that you want to make sure that we take a look at, now's a good time to type those in. Then another uh, area for personal leadership is blending the seven Fs. My colleague Paul Botts has written a book about what really works, and he came up with these seven Fs as foundational, I would say, to stay positive. And they're in alphabetical order as they're listed here. So the first one is, is faith. And what that really means, that's not about religion at all. That's about your internal spiritual life. It's the place where you go when things are really tough. And then family, your loved ones who you share a common sense of home. Finances, that's how your money funds your priorities. I love that definition. Fitness, that's your health of body. Friends, those are the people who share your joys and disappointments. Fun is that part of your life that is playful and joyful. And future is the hope that you have for yourself and others. And I put these two slides up here. Blending the seven Fs means when you're doing an activity, how do you think about integrating as many of these together as you can? And it's amazing to me as I work with these how I can, when I'm conscious of it and really aware, I can blend a lot of these together in my activities and then I feel more fulfilled. And the reason I have these slides up, in, up here is that I was on a leadership retreat with a group of people that we, every year, spend a, almost a week in September together. We've been doing this for almost 20, it's 15 years, this was retreat. Yeah, number 18, actually. And so I love the ocean. We rented a house on the ocean. I was out every day. And so I was able to blend fun. I love that. Future, because while I'm walking along the beach, I'm thinking ahead to what's the future hold for me and what would I like it to be. My friends, because I was with nine of my favorite friends in the world. And fitness. And you could also say I blended a little bit of faith there too because how can you not be connected to your spirit when you're at the ocean? So that's one example of how you can do that. And what we're discovering is using these seven Fs and blending them helps people to live with less stress, lead with less fear, and be more positive. And I think it's because these seven things really ground people and help you be connected to the things that are important. Um, to you. And it's interesting, I'll, I'll tell you this, um, and you can rate these uh, later as well, a and we recommend that people do this on a regular basis because it's a way to keep yourself in balance. <clears throat> and in our survey of over a thousand leaders, their order of satisfaction, family came out as one, future was their second highest level of satisfaction, three was friends, four was faith, five was fun, finances was six, and fitness was at the very bottom as number seven. So just a little place that you can compare how you're doing. And our next slide, um, I really want to, to uh, this is my leadership group when we were in um, Dillon Bay. And I think this phrase is so important to remember that nothing significant is ever done alone. So if I can give you anything from this webinar to take away, it's that don't work alone. It can be so easy to get isolated, we get so busy, and we're eating our lunch at our desk, we're not taking time to go out and take a walk because that next deadline is looming, that next email is looming. So find a way that you can be connected to other people. We're offering um, peer coaching groups for women leaders that are at that director and VP level because we tend to take care of everyone else <clears throat> before we take care of ourselves. But find a group, find uh, people that you admire, that you want to spend time with, that you can talk about your dreams and your aspirations. I know a while ago I realized that I needed a little bit more 
connections. So, and I didn't have some of the groups that I had started, like the Awesome Women group, and I had been in a business owners round table. They had just kind of naturally evolved. So now I'm in a book group at my church. I'm in a women's leadership circle. I'm in a business owners round table. <clears throat> and then I'm also working with a score coach who is also my mentor. I'm happier and I'm getting more, I would say I'm getting more done and I'm getting more creative about the things that are important for me to do. And my last slide is to stay in touch with me. I'm really grateful that you're on the webinar today. It was nice to have you. I hope that you've at least taken away one or two things from this that you can integrate and that would be important to you. So if you have a question or a challenge that we didn't deal with today that you want some help with, you can email me, rita at wiseleader.net. If you want to stay connected and be get my, uh, it's bi-weekly, newsletter or blog, you can go to wiseleader.net. And then if you are a women leader and you're a director or a VP level or you have friends or you know women leaders that are there and they would like to get connected to a peer coaching group, you can learn more by giving me a call or shooting me an email. All right, we just have uh, one more uh, one more question um, that's uh, uh, come up uh, as far as ranking the seven Fs. Uh, do you know how many people were involved in that study? Oh, there were about a thousand people that were involved in that. We have another question that uh, come in, uh, has come in. Um, uh, this person talks about how they keep their Facebook separate from their LinkedIn, so kind of keeping that personal self separate from professional self. Oh, I, um, however, uh, she's heard that there's a fairly newer trend of embracing employees as a whole. Uh, so I guess it's maybe this question of uh, how our personal social media overlaps with our organizations and, and how leaders maybe deal with that nowadays. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because especially with the millennials, they want to have their personal life and their work life fairly blended. So if you're a leader that has millennials reporting to you, they expect you to know that they were at a volleyball game last night and that you're going to ask about it when they get to work. So I always say this is a personal preference. So what do you feel comfortable with? And then think that through. There's no right or wrong answer to this. Some organizations have, um, I wouldn't say a rule, but some kind of preferences. So you can check with your um, organization to see if they have some recommendations or some guidelines is the word that I'm looking for. Otherwise, it's pretty much a personal choice, what you feel comfortable with and you can kind of experiment there. I keep mine totally separate. So I actually don't, I have a Facebook page, but I don't use it all that much. And it's, uh, it's a whole different group of, of friends that I'm connected with there, whereas my LinkedIn is definitely where my professional self shows up. Sure. Well, Rita, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate you uh, sharing your time and talent uh, with the audience online today. My pleasure. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We have uh, some uh, webinars coming up that I mentioned in October and also uh, throwing up uh, some other topics here that coming uh, coming up in November and December as well. And then uh, if you are on social media, as we were just talking about, uh, follow us on Twitter. We also have some great a great listing of LinkedIn groups that are across the University of Minnesota at minnesotaalumni.org slash LinkedIn. And then lastly, uh, members of the University of Minnesota Alumni Association make uh, initiatives like this webinar series possible. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, because of our members, we can enrich the lives of alumni, support student success, and make a better University of Minnesota. So become a member today at minnesotaalumni.org slash join. And that's all the conclusion of today's webinar. Thanks for joining us. Again, we have one coming up here on uh, Thursday about saying no to networking and yes about intentional uh, relationship building. So thanks again for joining us and thanks for being an active member of our worldwide University of Minnesota alumni community.